Hey guys, we're here at the Central Rolling Plains Co-op. We're gonna hang out with Larry. He's over here busy right now talking to somebody. We're gonna do a full tour of the gin while it's off. They've got it torn down, but hopefully it will uh, be pretty useful for some of y'all. We're gonna try to come back later and maybe get some, some footage of the gin running and maybe making some bells, but I think they're about a couple days out from that happening, so we'll see y'all in a second. Y'all are looking at the best cotton gin in the state of Texas right here. Yeah, right. <laughs> he actually got voted that or something, something pretty close to that I right did there. To be, yeah, I got to be gin of the year one year. Yeah. I'm very appreciative of that. Yes, okay. sir. All right, we're going to let her have this, and I guess we're going to try to show everybody from module throughout the entire gin and all the cool stuff we've upgraded. Okay. All right, so when we get it in, I mean, we haul from the field to the gin yard and store it until it's ready to go through the gin. Most of our modules are now coming in round. I'd say probably two thirds or better are round modules. We still have a lot of the conventional modules also, and we have to handle them a little bit different. So we go over here, here's the module feeder. We will unload onto these rollers and we control the speed of how fast it goes inside the gin, you know, depending on, is it good cotton, is it rough cotton, whatever the condition of the cotton is, dry, wet, whatever. What we're working on right here in the, in the, uh, on the other end is our unwrapper. And basically the way it works is those arms come down. As they come down, the cylinders turn and it completely picks that round module up. Then we cut the plastic and hit the button and the module begins to spin. As it spins, we pull the plastic out of the module. And once we get the plastic completely removed, we turn around and throw it into a plastic press. And we make about 700 pound plastic bales out of it. The arms then retract and set the module back onto the feeder and it goes on forward into the uh, cylinders which are turning and tearing the module apart. That part of it works the same way whether it's a round module or a conventional module. But we'll go through the cylinders. We drop into a huge bin which we meter. We control the speed coming out of that bin and it drops it into an airline. That airline, there's two of them down there. Each airline has an 8 million BTU burner blowing hot air trying to, or beginning to dry the cotton. It comes out of the, the pit, which is about 20 foot deep over there, up into another, uh, what we call a collider dryer. And there's another line of hot air coming in with another 8 million BTU burner that fluffs it and dries it really well. So in this end alone, we've got 32 million BTUs of heat. That's why we have a four inch gas line. No, nobody ever brings you wet okay. cotton, do they? We get wet cotton from time to time. Wasn't me. <laughs> uh, does the uh, unwrapper move back and forth when the modules are going, or is it just kind of yeah. so fast it doesn't matter? The unwrapper is stationary, and you can control the bed. The, all of these rollers are broke up into different sections. Okay. So once it sets it down on that section, it will, that section and the next one will speed up, and it'll get it. So it this one will be feeding slow, and this one comes fast, and it'll... Okay. bump it back together so that you have a continuous stream of cotton roughly the same size going in all the time. This all bell wrap? Oh. Yeah, this is our this is our strap. Uh, we just got a truckload of that in the other day. There's about enough, there's enough strap there for about 45,000 bales. And then we also have that much bagging. This bagging is blue. We're transitioning to the blue bagging instead of the, the conventional white or yellow. And uh, they claim less contamination, so we'll see. Are those barcoded so they can track them in the bag? They are not. They are not, but when we put the sticker on it, when we put the bale number on it, it's... That's how the, that's how the bales are tracked. That's how the bales are, are uh, yeah, track them from, from here to the, all the way through the middle. Okay. So, the denser round modules have created a few issues for us. Uh, we used to just drive all of these cylinders, or seven cylinders right there, and we used to drive these with one motor. 
Now we have two motors on there because we kept popping belts. It was just it was too much for one. So we put two motors on it now instead of one because you know the center of the round module is pretty dense. Is it the 690 or the 770 or is it all of them? Well we've ginned pretty much 690 all except for last year we ginned some 770s. Okay. But and I feel like that problem will just be multiplied with the 770. I oh think yeah. The bale is going to be more dense, it's going to be harder. Yeah. Those kind of things. So here is our first stage heaters. I see each one of these are an 8 million BTU burner and uh, they roar like a jet engine when we hit wet cotton. So I've never been down there. I didn't know that was that deep. Oh yeah. So if you want to, let's look over here. Here's our spike cylinders that are turning tearing the cotton up and the cotton drops down you can't really get a good I'll shot turn, down there i'll turn the light on but uh anyway these tear the module up and then the cotton falls into this holding bin and goes down and then you can see the serrated uh, cylinders down there and they feed it in as we're see, there we as go. required so so these are spinning right here Yes. And they're just eating the modules and then it just sends it straight down. They're, they're just breaking it up. And then what happens is we're coming out of, like I say, we're, we have a fan actually in the back of the building and we'll look at that here in a little bit, but we have one fan that is sucking from right here. This is with the intake for the fan. Okay. So it sucks in, makes a vacuum on that, on that heater head in there, creates a flame, goes over here, goes down, and then you can see it goes down that far. Oh gosh. It is uh, it's 27 feet to the bottom of that hole. It's a ways down there. Yeah. And then you can kind of see the, the, the pipes going in. And they, they go in, go underneath, come over here, pick up this cotton as it's metered in, and go up these pipes to this collider dryer. So you've got cotton coming in this way with hot air, and then we have another fan that's sucking also from that, those heaters in the corner, which come over here and it has more hot air that begins to dry the cotton. These are centrifugal elbows. We use these for uh, basically skimming air. We're pulling so much air through here that we, it would be a huge pipe to get it through. So what we're doing is we're just sucking uh, some of the used air, I mean, it'll be humid because we've dried cotton out, but the cotton itself will ride on the heel of that elbow and come around here. So cotton goes up this one, just air goes in here. Kind of bleed some air off. This goes air, all I'm the guessing. way to the back of the gin, picks up cotton under the first stage stick machine and goes up to the top on the second stage and then works its way out to the back. Okay. Yeah, there would just probably just be too much air in there and too much humidity if you didn't get rid of some of it. Yes. So, same setup here? Yes. We are what you call a split stream gin, meaning we have two lines going in. We have two sides. We have an A and a B, and identical equipment on both of them. And you can run, you know, we always run both sides, or you can run one or the other. But uh, we are a, we're a 10 foot split stream gin, which means we have 20 feet total of cleaning capacity going in. So, as you can see, we've got a lot of spare parts. Uh, being as far as we are from Lubbock, we have to keep a lot of spare parts. This year, especially with who knows what the availability is, we're keeping a few extra, but you just can't anticipate everything that you need. What's the uh, worst part so, on the bottom down there? Uh, the blue one is a 125. The other one over there is a 150, and I believe that's a 100 on the very end on the bottom. Just spares? And then we've got this, this gray one sitting on the pallet. That's a spare 100. Here's another spare 100. Uh, there's another spare 200 over there on the floor, that blue one, the other light blue one. Hmm. We keep spare uh, air compressor heads. You never know what's going to happen. We use a lot of air in the gin. So. These cylinders are just 
real similar to the ones we saw in the module feeder, but these go in our horizontal cleaner. And it's, it's called a horizontal cleaner simply because it's horizontal. I mean, the cotton we saw coming on the outside of the heel of the elbow outside comes in that insulated line and it hits that splatter box and it, it busts open. This machine is 12 feet wide with 15 cylinders. And underneath each one of the spike cylinders, it just has some grid bars in there. Uh, spaced about, I think about three eighths space in or something like that. And it, the, the cylinders just rub the cotton across those grid bars and we get an amazing amount of leaf and fine trash out right here before it ever goes into the rest of the gin to get uh, processed and that way it doesn't get, a lot of the leaf comes out right here so it doesn't get tangled up in the lint as we go, as we go on. So that kind of helps with the leaf grease? The other side of that elbow we were looking at outside comes in right here and it will go down underneath and after the cotton comes through here it'll pick the cotton up and take it to the other side and go back up to the top. We'll see okay. that here in a minute. But is that that bled off air? No. Where's that? Where's that air go? Just it. Uh, well, yes, it is. It's the inside elbow. Okay. So it's the it's the humid air we were talking about. Okay. Top machine, just like we call this one a horizontal cleaner. This one is an incline cleaner, simply because the cylinders are at an incline; they're not horizontal. So does the same thing. All right. It's spiked cylinders over grid bars, do a little rubbing, some more of the leaf trash falls out into this pipe. The cotton itself will fall down this direction and go into this machine, which is just like your bar extractor on your cotton. This is a stick machine. Uh, this one in particular is a, a Rescuer 396. And, and uh, Hold anyway, it's been, in, it's been in the gin since the gin was built. In how, what kind the of 80s. is that the like limiting how much cotton we're running through the gin right now? Yes, actually, I'm sorry, this is a rescuer 4000, and uh, we had some 396s in the second stage, but we took those out. This is what's limiting us now is you know, when I first started and everybody was running strippers, you could get about two bales per hour per foot through the gin, so we have two 10 foot machines. That's 20 foot times two, 40 bales an hour would be all you could get on stripper cotton. When we started going to burr extracted cotton, it jumped up to three bales per foot. And I know some gins that are pushing four to four and a half through them. I will not do that because I feel like that overloads our cleaning. So we're gonna stay, uh, we'll stay in the three bale an hour range. So we'll stay right in about the 60 bale an hour range. We have more gin stand, we have more lint cleaners than 60 bales an hour, but I like to spread that load out. And instead of just overloading the machine, let's spread it out. Like we have five gin stands. We could get by with four, but we have five so that we don't have to run them as hard. And if something does happen to one, well, we can speed the others up a little bit and maintain the throughput of the gin. Sounds good. That's why you were cotton ginner of the year out there, thinking ahead. <laughs> Well, and like you're on your burr extractor where you're seeing things come out in your trash chute. Yep. That's this. That's okay. what this is. Right so it's just here. an auger and it's just dumping it down. Yes. This is a uh, auger goes to the other side and it catches all the, you know, we've got grid bars in there just like your uh, burr extractor. Are you we running them about as close as we are? Yeah. Okay. So they're running pretty tight. They're the uh, five eighths or three quarters. Okay. Is kind of how we set that. But uh, all the trash comes to here. There's another conveyor under the floor that goes out to a big fan that blows it out to our burr stacker out back. Okay. And uh, we look at that here in a minute. But where's the cotton as the going? as the cotton is coming through the machine, it'll drop drop down on top of this vacuum box right here. And it has paddles inside of it with rubber on the end and that seals up against those scrolls on the end. And what it's doing, like I said, we've got that air blowing underneath. Well, we don't want it to suck air out of here because we're, we're still on the suck side of the fan. So we want it to pull air from out there. So we, if we didn't have good flashing in here, we'd suck all of our air right here and we wouldn't have enough air to satisfy our burners and we couldn't run our, run our heaters. Yeah. So this comes, 
This is the cotton, and this is this particular one is the B side right now. So this is coming under the under here under the floor. And it comes up right here. So this is the A side, the B side. Under the floor, what you can't see is another miniature uh, skimmer elbow, like outside. And again, we can't pull enough air through our grid bars as they are without pulling cotton through them. I mean, we can crank it up and we can pull air through there, but we're gonna pull a lot of the cotton through the grid bars and send it out to the bar pile. So we're short circuiting some of the air here we got to have that much pull over here, but we don't have to have that much up there. So all of that goes up to another incline cleaner, drops into another stick machine, drops into a distributor conveyor. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute. But we'll, while we're here, let's look at the fans. So like I said, we're a split stream gen. So on the far end down there is 1A fan, 1B, 2A, 2B. This one is our overflow fan. And you can see these fans are not small, nor are the motors that turn them. We've got 150 horse motors on each one of these fans. There's five of these okay. right here. And then uh, that one still has a hundred horse on it. And what's and this one's just kind of, this need one more. is uh, at the end of the gin stands where you see the cotton going into that overflow. Yeah. It picks up the cotton there and brings it back to the beginning okay. to, to recycle it, so. not recycle, but to recirculate it yeah. actually. Okay. And then you can see down through there, we have a fan on each one of our lint cleaners. Each one of those fans have a 60 horse motor on it. There's 10 of those. And then farther on down is a, a battery condenser fan. It's pretty good sized. And we also have two more of these fans on the far end, pulling off of the lint cleaners, pulling moats off of the lint cleaner. A lot of air. There's another big fan down here it's the one that pulls all the trash out of the conveyor and blows it to the, the stacker out back. What's, uh, what's with the new tank there? Fire suppression. Okay, so that's hopefully. Cool. hopefully. Hopefully. And that's just for the burrs? Yes. Well, yes and no. It's a 10,000 gallon storage tank. We're gonna be tying into it with some sprinklers and this, that, and the other to go up on top of the burr pile. We also pull water out of that tank, come into the gin to feed our RO system. Okay. We have an RO system on our humidifier because as you're cooking that water with this hard mineral, it corrodes up pretty yep. rapidly. So Makes sense. Like I say, another big fan down here, another one here, two more on that end down there. So you can see a lot of our horsepower is used to move air, a lot of it. I would guess, and I've never sat down and done the numbers, but I'm going to say somewhere around 55 to 60% of our horsepower is probably used. Just to create air. We have somewhere, we're just under 4,000 horsepower overall for the gin. Uh, 1,025 of that alone is on the press. Yeah. So lots of hydraulic fluid, lots of volume, lots of pressure. That's why uh, we don't crank up until we get the meter at. That's correct. You ready for that new press? We're, we're very fortunate to have all the electrical that we do. I mean, we went through and, and had to upgrade our electrical several years ago, and we've had to add to some of this, that, and the other. We have capacitors to limit the demand when we do start. Instead of just, you know, if you hit a you hit a start button and that motor takes off right away, uh, you got a big load. Yeah. And then if you've done that and watched the amp meter, it'll peg out and then it'll come back down where it's supposed to. Our bigger motors, like on those fans out there, we have VFDs on those, which is variable frequency drive, and they act as a soft start. So when you're starting a 150 horse motor on that big of a chunk of iron to get to turn into about 1400 RPM, it eases it up. It doesn't just yeah. try to go. It takes a little bit of time. So that, that relieves some of our demand. And then like I said, we have capacitors in here that are, you know, they store the electricity and then as you start it, well, it'll it'll discharge and then it charges back up and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it helps on our power factor. How long does it uh, take to just, like say right now you were ready to gin to get a bell out the end from right now completely off, how long would it take? It would take about, it would take between four and five minutes to start mm -hmm. the gin. And then once we got going, uh, of course first bell's always slow, but it would take another 
probably another two minutes. So I'd say in six minutes, six to seven minutes, you could have a bale out the door. It's just don't want to crank everything up at one time. It'll overload stuff. Mm -hmm. Here we come to the gin stands. And as I was saying earlier, that cotton, after it comes out of the second stage cleaning, it falls into to the distributor conveyor, which is the long part, goes all the way to the Is that just like end. a giant auger? It's a giant auger. And, and, I, and it does exactly what it sounds like it was. It takes that cotton from here, and it fills this hopper up, and then it fills that one up, and, and so on down the line to keep cotton here so that we can have a good, good feed of cotton. Uh, underneath, well, what happens in here, and we'll look when we get down to the other end, but what happens in here, you're separating the lint from the seed. This is, this is Eli Whitney's thing right here. Everything else in this gin is accessories, kind of like power windows or XM radio or whatever. But this is the heart of the gin right here, and it's where the separation of the lint from the seed takes place. The seed will drop down underneath into a conveyor goes over there into a set of scales, gets weighed, gets dropped into a blower that blows the seed to those overhead bins outside. The lint will go, uh, the lint will come out the back of the gin stand. Ours runs through an air jet, which is basically, uh, air jet was discovered totally by accident. Somebody ran into the lint flue with a forklift and dented the pipe in and didn't tell anybody. And then later on, somebody discovered, hey, there's a lot of trash coming out of this hole. What's the deal? So all this is is that the, the cotton comes in this chute, comes in right down here, comes around like this. There's a little knife blade that sticks in here, and you adjust that in and out for how much, uh, how much you need to take out and it varies from variety to variety. The little fuzz that it takes out will come out the back and then right here across the lint will go up, comes over here. And you can see we've got markings on here so we can tell <laughs> what goes where. But anyway, first off it comes in here, down, around, goes back to this lint cleaner, comes into here, goes back up, over, down, over, down into a pipe. Not complicated at all. No. Nah. And this pipe runs all the way to the other end of the gin and up to the top, up to the battery condenser. On the other end, uh, and this has to be in one pipe and it has a lot of pull on it. On the other end, that pipe is 42 inches in diameter. So it's, it's this tall. Okay. It's big. Are those mass flow sensors you're looking at right there? Those are our Argus system, which is uh, spark detection. Okay, because cotton doesn't catch on fire ever. <laughs> yeah, occasionally. <laughs> but we have those throughout the gin to help us. Uh, just, you know, you'd be surprised at how many fires. Of course, if you've ever stripped cotton at night in a field that has rocks, or flint rocks especially, and turn the lights off, the sparks are amazing that are mm -hmm. in those row units. But, uh, and kind of the same thing here, you'd be amazed at how many sparks we actually get uh, just in normal running. So that helps us determine not only that we have a fire, but what area, because we've got those located there, they're down below here, they're on the pipe outside that came up, I don't know if you saw them or what, not. What are we gonna do if there is a fire? And you know where it's if, at. If we have a fire, they are set to make the gin stands pull out so we stop the flow of cotton coming this way. Most of the fires will happen right here. Okay. So we'll stop the flow of cotton that's coming in this way. We can turn the fans off manually to decrease the amount of air that the fire's getting. And then we just go find it and start trying to pick it out. Okay. It's not like what I'm doing if I'm on fire. Like no. You're, you're singling it out here. Yes. And We're trying to isolate it and get it put out. I'm trying to get it out of the machine as fast as possible. And right. I don't really care where it's at. Right. We'll come back to the control room here in a minute, but we'll go on down this way for now. And we're looking at one, two, three, five stands? Yes, we have, in particular, we have four Cherokee 193s, which means they have 193 saws in it, and we have one Lummis 203. Okay. Uh, we did an upgrade several years back, and Cherokee helped us out to start with, and now we've 
We've added a fifth gen stand whenever we close the Inadale facility, and this is what's getting can us we, up to speed. Can we see those salts? I or is can't. It too deep? Yeah, I can't move it in right now. But anyway, between each one of these ribs, this whole front will move in, and between each one of these ribs, there will be a uh, a saw blade will come out right in between here. This, you probably can't actually see it, but there are some carbide inserts down here, and this is the ginning point. This is where the tooth of the saw actually hooks on to the lint, and when it pulls it through there, it separates the lint from the seed. That's the ginning point. So uh, these, this particular one has 203 saw blades in it. Each one of those saw blades are about Fourteen dollars a piece. Each one of those ribs are. You got, you got any used ones about, around here? Yeah, I think. Each one of those ribs are with the carbide insert are a little over fifty bucks. Hmm. You can get expensive quick. So yes. How many bells can you run through that before you're looking at replacing all those saw blades? It, it it depends, of course, on the condition of the cotton. But on average, we get about uh, six thousand bales per stand. So at 30,000 bales, we'll start looking at trying to swap out. We keep spare cylinders, spare saw cylinders for all of these. So when we need to change one out or we have a saw go bad and we need to replace it, we drop the front off, we take, the, uh, take that saw cylinder out, put the new one in, put it back on, four hours we're going. That's why you got a spare one. That's why we keep spares, yes sir. That's what I'm ready to see. I want to see this new press down here that we got. <laughs> okay, so lint cleaners, and I apologize, I don't have the lights on them, we can see. But anyway, lint cleaner has a different type of saw inside of it. It's a tube that's wrapped with a strand of saw material, and it's one strand, the whole length of it. So then it has a grid bar that it'll clear. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, it has a grid bar that it goes around and it's the tolerance of about a pop can thick. So the lint gets down into the teeth of the saw, goes through there, and again, centrifugal force, if it's a stick or a burr or a leaf or something that's heavier than that lint, it slings out. As it slings out and it goes by that bar, it gets cut off. And that part that comes off of it is what you call moats. So in our case, we suck our moats over here, run them through another cleaner, put them into a bale, and uh, that bale is marketed, if possible, what happens there. After that, after that takes place and that cotton is clean coming off that saw, there's a brush on the back side of it, wiping the lint out of the teeth of the saw, and it goes into that pipe I was talking about. The other end of that pipe, down there by the number one lint cleaners, comes under the floor down here, goes around and up into that square ductwork, goes up to the top, to what's called a battery condenser. And basically, it's basically a big separator. So you're moving all this air and lint through the, uh, there, there's a big screen drum. There's a six foot screen drum up there that's, that's uh, I can't remember what size the perforations are on the holes, but small. And, and the lint will stick to that drum and rotate around because we're pulling from the inside of the drum comes around, it's got a rubber doffer cylinder that wipes it off the screen, puts it on another roller, puts it into the steam roller down the lint slide into the press. The fan that's pulling from the other end to here is this one. That's a big boy. Yes. Cool. It's that tall, you know, I don't, but, uh, uh, is that reduction or sped up? No, it's it's uh, slowed down actually. Okay. That's an 1800 RPM motor and this is probably running 12 to 14, somewhere in that range. And then these two fans are what suck the moats off of each lint cleaner down here and then goes inside to be cleaned and baled. Okay. You were saying that steamroller, that, that's what adds the moisture back to the bell so we can add weight, right? Yes. This is our humidifier. Uh, we're working on getting it clean. We're not finished yet.
This has spray nozzles all around it, and they will spray, uh, they're spraying water. This in the back is a 1 million BTU burner that's shooting the flame out here, and we're mixing the flame in the water and making steam. And it gets sucked up in there. It goes, uh, as you've got that bat of cotton coming down, we're pulling through the bat of cotton. So the cotton is capturing the moisture and sticking it in there. We raise, the, you know, by, by the rule, you can have 7% moisture in your bale. And uh, most of what we gin is gonna be five and a half to six. So if we add just 1%, I mean, yeah, we're only adding five pounds to a 500 pound bale, but that's five pounds that, you know, especially this year, if you've got dollar a pound cotton, I mean, that's five dollars a bale. Yeah. Still doesn't sound like a whole lot of money until you figure that we're gonna gin at least 80,000 at five dollars a bale, that's $400,000 yeah. back in the producer's pocket. And that's, that's what we, you know, we try to gin efficiently and effectively and that helps us. One thing that does also is it decrease, it makes the cotton compress easier, so it decreases the amount of pressure we need to press a bale. But yeah, this is our, this is our new press. Can we go down there? Uh, sure, if you want to. This hole right here goes down another 20 feet from here, and that's where the bottom ram is. We have an 18 inch, oh, let's go to the other side. Well, this is the turning motor. It's a servo motor, so it, it counts like 10 spots in one degree. Mm -hmm. So for every degree that you may, it's got 10 positions it could stop in, and that's enough to get, get it squared up. Moves real easy. Yeah, the light's not on, but anyway, this is the bottom ram. The, the rod on the ram itself measures 18 inches. Uh, I'm sure a smarter person than I could figure, could figure out 18 inch ram with 2,200 pounds of pressure, how much force that is, but it's a lot. Yeah. It will take, this box is approximately uh, 14 and a half feet tall. We will squeeze that 14 and a half feet down to 20 inches. 19 to 20 inches, and then wrap it with the strap and let go of it, and it'll be a 22 inch bale. Dang. It's amazing. But, Just but there's, a, there's a line like this on each side feeding that. And this is a hydraulic hole? Yes. And we're going 24 more feet here, and we're how deep right now? We're seven, uh, 15 now. We actually, it surprised me, we actually had to raise our floor up two feet when we put this press in. And, and see the other one, you can push it and turn it. This one won't move because it's on that servo motor. Okay. So, so basically this is what we're we'll packing. Do, we'll, we'll turn over here and the lint will be coming down from the battery condenser and the steamroller and it, it goes in here and the tramper, you know, when it puts a charge in, the tramper will push it down and it, it just keeps feeding until it takes a set amount of pressure, which we, we adjust to get our correct bale weight. Takes so much pressure for that tramper to make its stroke, and it'll say, I'm done, I got all I can stand. When that happens, these boxes turn, and now you've got an empty box over here, so the whole cycle starts again, and you have that 18 inch ram raising up, pressing all the way up. I always thought all the packing was done on this side, but it's really done on the other side, so on the bottom. Okay, yes. that makes sense up and down and packs it in. This part so what happens here whenever that box is in line and that press the ram presses it up it like I said it'll press it up to about 19 and a half inches is actually where it goes. When it does these will uh, shoot the green plastic strap, we'll come in here, go the other side, hit those chutes, come back, come up, and then it welds itself. And it lets go and it stays put. That takes about four seconds. Yeah. It's not very long. And then it'll let go and 
Do you have any, do you have any videos out. of that on your phone? We can add in this video. Yeah. So that's that's so pretty cool to watch. This is the strap. And I said the strap will be fed over there. It'll go into the machine and it goes around and comes back on top of itself and the little jaws will grab it and just rub it up and down and make it weld. But it's it cold will, welds basically? No, uh, they're pretty warm when they come in. I don't know if they're cold, but, but it'll suck this. It'll, it'll get this. Uh, well, there it goes. It's, this'll free spin. All this does is everything on its own. Don't have anybody back here poking wires. Or, like and these are ran just straight across here? Yes. How, uh, how many bells can you get out of each one of these rolls? It takes six rolls and I think you can get, I'm not sure. I can't remember right offhand. I know that we gin roughly a thousand bells a day and we'll change every one of those at least once. Okay. But yeah, this will be This will be like this when it's in operation and those straps will come over here, come through here, and go into the machine. Go into the machine right here. That's just amazing how all that works right there. Somebody smarter than us. <laughs> Way smarter. And this is the control box just for the strapper. We have one air compressor that's dedicated to the strapper and the bagger because we re require super dry air. No rust, no moisture, no nothing. Uh, we have a couple of dryers set up through the gin to make sure that that happens. And you just gotta have really clean air to make this work. So when you get through, the bale will fall out onto these chains and it'll be carried up to here. And then that part over there will start, will, that's called the pusher, it'll start pushing also. And you can kind of see here the bale or the bagging is on the jaws, so to speak. This is like a big bread wrapper. It's open on one end. So you push that bale in, it'll stop at a certain point, and the sample grabbers will come in and grab the sample and back out. Is that automated? Yes. Right. When it gets that, it goes ahead and it pushes the bale through all the way to here. This little part, these chains pop up, so it'll all roll out good, and then this is the scales right here. It'll, this'll raise up and it'll, it'll get its weight. When it does that, the bale will turn a quarter turn. And the reason it does that is the end of the bale is open. You know, I said it's like a bread wrapper. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a person leaning over trying to do this all the time, it's right here. So they'll close it up. We use a giant stapler which I don't know where it's at right now, but anyway, we've got a big stapler. It's about that long and uh, fold it up a certain way, staple it shut, slap one tag on this side of the bale, slap another tag on this side of the bale, hit the button, spin it around, and it goes out there, stands up, gets pushed out the, the door, and the forklift picks up four at a time and sets them on the flatbed truck. And they're gone with the Never to be seen again. They go somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> You gonna use them white rest of those white bags right there or are you gonna switch to blue? Yeah. We'll use up the white ones and then see where we get to from there. Is that about the last of the white bags? Don't know. We got blue on this shipment. I think we still have a pallet or two of white oh, okay. left. So we'll use those up. Okay. Press console, everything's touch screen. Uh, diagnostics, it, much like your screens and your stripper. It's more than just a more than just an LCD yeah. screen to look at. Uh, and again, like your stripper, there's several pages to it that you can scroll through. It's basically automatic, right? Yes. We can, we can watch and see how much pressure is taken for that tramper to clear on each stroke. We can see the last 10 bales that it made, how the pressure built. We can see uh, how much pressure it's taking that bottom ram to come up. 
we take a moisture reading with the microwave sensor right there, the Bomax. That ties back to the steamroller and tells it to increase or decrease the amount of water that's being sprayed or raise the temperature or whatever. That's automatic. We were, we were at uh, Dell City the other day and they have that on a hay baler. They were baling alfalfa and we, we were asking has it, if it, and if it notices the moisture is high, it'll paint it. It'll put a little spray paint on the side of the bale. It's pretty cool. This part, when it gets down to here, if everything's working, the only thing you do is, like I said, we grab a sample up there, it comes out in a little gray door. You get the sample out of there, you got a coupon to go to the classing office, put it together, put it in a bag, put it in a big bag. That's what those little bags are right there. Mm -hmm. And that bag, does it go with? Goes with the sample. It goes in okay. another bag that goes to the classing So there's just a whole bunch of samples? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so we've got one person that does that. We've got another person that closes the top of the bale and puts the tags on. And it's, an, it's fast enough, but yet not too fast, that one person could do it. But they're going to be hooked up the whole time. But everything, like I said, we set the bale weights. You may have to adjust it a little bit, depending on whatever. Once that tramper hits its spot, it tells the press to turn, it turns, it locks, starts the tramper again, starts the bottom ram up, gets to where it goes. Everything ties, straps, done, that lets go. Bottom ram goes down, bale falls out, goes over here, gets pushed through the bag, gets sampled and all that good stuff and gets over here and then it stops. Yeah. And that's the first time that you have to have some human touch because there's a, a button right there. Whenever, whenever the person uh, closing the top and getting the tags on is finished, they'll hit that button. The bale turns back a quarter turn and heads out the door. Awesome. Um, I guess so this is a brand new press. You're probably going to have fun trying to get that weight down that first couple bells. We, uh, you know, we ran it last year. We didn't get to gin that much with it, but we ran it last year. Okay. And I think we've got... See, I've got an idea. We've got a pretty good, pretty good handle on it okay. at this point. The fascinating thing to me, I mean, this, is, this press is... Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the latest, greatest thing out, but it is pretty top of the line. It's a Lummis HSVS, which is high speed variable stroke. The tramper adjusts itself. The uh, pusher adjusts itself, depending on how big of a charge of cotton. If you're putting in a huge charge of cotton and it's having trouble, it'll speed itself up. If it's slow, it'll slow itself down. So everything is trying to maximize uh, pressures. But the most interesting part of this whole press is the pump. Are we still shooting for 480? On the bells? No, we shoot for five to five ten. Five to five ten. Well, that's a tiny pump. Yeah. It's like on a frac site. So, all of these pumps on this side are dedicated to, all of these plus one on the other side are dedicated to the bottom ram. That's all they do is pump that ram up and down. But you can imagine with an 18 inch hole, you gotta have a lot of fluid to cover that. Uh, there's one on the end that is the pusher. There's another one on the other side that's the tramper. And there's another one that's the top ram. And it's like just said, hydraulic oil storage? There's just, a, just another one. Another one just like the, well, there's, there's six, yeah. Anyway, 1,025 horsepower total. And I'm like, this looks kind of funny having a great big motor right next to a little one. <laughs> but this one, this little motor of all things provides all the pressure to the valves. So without that little motor, none of this does anything. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, it's always the small, small guy making the operation run. Yep. And then, you know, normally we gin when it's cool or just downright cold, but, uh, we can't let that oil get too hot and as fast as we're circulating it, it's gonna get hot. So we have three coolers over there. And when they come on, they're moving a lot of air themselves. And they will cycle off and on and keep the, keep the oil in a good, good temperature. How much heat's coming off those? A lot. So that's pretty warm. Well, right? I say that, but the oil itself will not exceed 130. In our case, 135 maybe. Usually it's around 125, 120 to 125, and it'll, the fans will cycle off and on. But, so, you know, again, for this whole thing, we had to put, we put in, a, we chose to put in a new motor control center, and 
because really by the time we got through scavenging that other one and moving things around and setting the other, we had more tied up in it than what this cost. I'm thankful we're not doing this this year because the way supplies are with everything, it's, it's a nightmare. It's everywhere right now. COVID's making yes. just everything super hard. Yes. But yeah, we have... Uh, How many gallons are in the system? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, a bunch. <laughs> I can't remember. It was, we got a truckload of totes of oil. And I think we had three or four spare just for reserve. So it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It wow. is a lot. And, just regular hydraulic oil? And just like you think, when that, get, when that oil gets hot and that whole thing gets hot, it's just a heater block. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can stand out here and cook. This is regular hydraulic oil? Yeah. It's, uh, well, we use uh, like AW68, ISO68. You know what we use in modular boilers? You use 68. Most people use 46, but you can use 32, 46, 68, whatever. Okay. Oh. Was this added on and then this next doghouse was added on again? This, I think to this wall was original and then we added that on for the bales. Okay. Yeah. We were loading outside. Yep. All right, let's go into the control room. What you doing? So this is the captain's chair. What are you doing? This is where the jenner just trying spends to... his day. Uh, he can look out the window and see how the module is coming in. He can kind of see what's going on there. He can look at the camera system to see what's going on in different places. Uh, we, we put this in because when we started adding machinery, we got to where we couldn't see places. And so like we're looking up at the top of the battery condenser, uh, we're looking where to go? Back side of the uh, lint cleaners, right here, and it, just all through the gin, so we can we can look through there and see what's going on. This is the layout of the gin. It starts outside in the steady flow, which is just below the module feeder spike cylinders we saw. It goes into the vacuum. Comes over here, goes into the horizontal cleaner, the incline cleaner, into the stick machine, into the second stage incline cleaner, into the second stick machine, and then to the distributor conveyor above each gin stand. And out of the gin stand, we're going into the link cleaners, come out of the link cleaners, and go into the condenser, battery condenser, steamroller, into the press. So this is, we used to have a console that ran from about where you're standing, well, from right there to over there. With just switches and all kinds of stuff? start and stop buttons on everything. And you had to know where they were. Mm -hmm. This way, you can think of, you know, well, it's, it's a 3B link cleaner. Okay, one, two, three, B, right there. Will it start flashing at you if you got a problem with something? It will, yes. You know, to me, it's backwards because all of them are green right now, but when they're running, they're red. And if they start flashing, usually it's it's uh, yellow and red, and that means it stopped. So if it stopped, you got a problem. Uh, you know, as you're running everything through here, and this stops, well, you start backing up in a hurry. So if you don't get it stopped in to stop try to, having, to try to help with that, we have. A little product here called Air Tools, which is pitot tubes scattered throughout the gin at various points. And we know how much air should be pulled at that point. If it starts dropping off, we know we need to slow down and see what's wrong, whatever's going on. This one is where uh, we're controlling the heaters. We're monitoring the load on the module feeder, first stage incline, second stage incline, our humidifiers. Air control eight, this is a pretty cool feature, but this ties in with all the VFDs on some of the big motors that we have, and we can set them, like this one is set to run at 80%, this one is set at 82, this one at 85, and it, it just fine tunes the air, is what it does. Uh, 
and we can see, you know, we can look and uh, there's last year's bail count. There's all kinds of things on there. This screen controls the four Cherokee gin stands. We can't turn the motor on, but we can uh, pull the gin in and start ginning, or we can speed it up or slow it down from here, and we can kick it out also. So there's VFDs on the gin stands too? Yes. The, uh, this is our new gin stand control. We're, we're gonna see how that works because we've had these long enough that they're obsolete. So we took one off completely and put a new gen stand control on it. So we've got one set of spare parts. And we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Usually, uh, they'll have it set to where one screen is on this, the other screen is on this to watch. This is where he's controlling how fast. Uh, this is where he's monitoring the modules as they're coming into the feeder. And we, had to, we added a second system to control how fast it's coming in. Now, that big uh, pit, or the big hole we were looking in behind the module feeder cylinders is the positive flow. And then down here, each one of these, like I said, they're the ones that's turning and metering it in. So if we get this full, we're not that far from choking those cylinders we were looking at. We don't mm -hmm. want to do that. So we try to keep this down here about 25% or so. Same thing with this overflow. Overflow is down here on the end of the gin stands. If we're carrying more cotton down that distributor conveyor than we can get into the gin stands, it will fall into here. And as it does, there's a pipe underneath, picks it up, brings it around, comes back in up here and just recirculates. It means you just slow the whole thing down. Yes. Okay. It's a little different. I, I haven't been out here since you've updated. When, when was all this put in? Like last year, two years ago? Uh, I think we did this in can't remember, 15? Oh, this has been a while since I've been here. But. Oh, how many guys does it take to run this place now? What's the way we got it set up? We have, we use uh, 11 per shift. That's including the yard truck driver. So, we have two guys on the module feeder, two guys walking the gin stands, two guys on the press, forklift, a sweeper, running around looking at stuff, watching things, cleaning up, takes care of the moat press, and then uh, the yard truck guy and the junior. How many guys would I have said 20 years ago to do that? When I got here, we were using 18. To, and I'm not patting myself on the back, but when I got here, we were using 18 to gin about 40 bales an hour. Now we're running 11 to gin 60. Okay. I mean, we, we can gin 60, it's not, it's not unreachable by any means, but I prefer, I don't look at how many bales per hour we're running, I look at how many bales per week. Yeah. Because as with anything, you're gonna have days that you just do super and you're gonna have days that you don't do well at all. Yeah. So at the end of the week, I wanna gin 7,500 bales, 7,500 to 8,000. It's not bad. Well, you take, you know, most years, if you're ginning 8,000 bales a week and you gin for 10 weeks, you're done. Yeah. So when this thing was built, it was a super gen, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I used to think that there was no way uh, the harvesters could keep up with us if we were ginning seven thousand a week or something like that. The the CSs have totally changed that mm -hmm. because they can. Yep, they'll run out of cotton before we do. Technically, so. one seven seventy. If if you listen to deer, will feed this gen. But that's you can't run all day. Right. That, you need two of them to feed it, technically. Well, you, yeah, because it'll whatever field it's in, it'll finish that field, and then it's got to yeah. move, and that's deadhead time. But yeah, yeah, if we're, if we're running, you know, sixty bales an hour, and I think on the six nineties they were talking like twenty five was easy, and uh, so yeah, a couple of those. It's all it's crazy. It takes. Yeah, that's all it takes. <laughs> but we do run twenty four seven versus. Yeah. You don't always get to run. Around the it clock rains, on stripper. it gets wet, yeah. But it's just amazing that these strippers, I mean, are getting this efficient. Because we're up in the one, like we're running up there in the top of the panhandle, it's just dry, 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 and that thing just flows through there. And supposedly it'll do 60 bells, we're gonna find out. So, y'all wait for the next video, should be out in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm.
Oh, is that right. about it? Yeah, well, that's the gin. Uh, there's nothing, no, I'm trying to think, there's nothing really out there we need to look at. It's just a gin office. Yeah. You don't, y'all need to see that. There's nothing cool in there. <laughs> so. We do have one thing that's pretty cool. Uh, we have a, what they call unattended truck scales. So we enter the information onto our PCCA uh, program and dispatch the modules to the trucks. And then each truck has its own tablet. So whatever modules are dispatched to that particular truck will show up on the tablet. He can hit a button that gives him GPS directions on how to get to the field. We always get them to the field. We can't get them to the module because they get put in different places yeah. all the time. But we get them to the field, they have to find the module. They come back, they pull onto the scales, hit another button to weigh it, and it'll sit there and think for a minute, and then it'll say exit scale. On the tablet, it'll say set it on row two. And so they know to go set it on row two. That weight gets entered into PCCA system and is totally automatic. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, this is Larry Black with Central Road and Plains Co-op. Um, appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. I'll let you get out of here. Y'all have fun. See y'all.